We're thrilled to welcome Sarah Choi, partner at Wing VC, to the show today. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Chris. And let's kick things off. Uh, Sarah, can you provide a brief intro for us? Sure, happy to. So now I'm a partner at Wing VC, and we invest at the early stages in enterprise tech companies. But more specifically, I invest at the intersection of biology and data. So aptly called BioX Data, our practice and focus area, is really about the convergence of technology and biology and sophistic sophisticated forms of computation. Um, we're really we're interested in technologies that will shape the very foundation for the life sciences. And we can get more into that a bit later. Uh, prior to joining Wing, I was in fact a founder and uh, sold my last company, which was a mobile data company. And way earlier on, I had started my career off at Google, where I spent about four years there. And thank you for that personal background and a bit of intro also into Wing. Uh, we'd love to get a little bit of context, um, more broadly speaking. Can you provide a brief intro on Wing VC for us? Yeah, happy to. So we get involved at some of the earliest stages. You know, some of the founders that I work with, in fact, had not much more than a pitch deck and a big idea when they came to us. And so definitely our philosophy is to not be afraid to back founders of that sort and instead give those founders the tools, the support, the strategic advice mm -hmm. that they might need to succeed. So in addition to our investing partners, where we have a team of six, we also have a whole team of specialists who are all there to help our founder succeed, aptly called our founder success platform. They offer help with things like talent, marketing, customers, research. In fact, I mean, they're a pretty phenomenal resource. And even just in that description, I hope you get a sense for what we're about here at Wing, which is early, incredibly thematically focused. For me, it's BioX data. Mm -hmm. And then really hands-on partners because we realize what a long journey this is. And my gosh, isn't, isn't it better? Isn't it more fun, in fact, with a community of sport around you? Absolutely. And turning this back a little bit over to you, uh, as you mentioned, you began your career with Google before becoming a co-founder of two startups, uh, Chow and Airfox. And now you're at Wing, where you have a particular focus in digital life sciences, that BioX data uh, focus that you talked about. And so we'd love to learn a little bit more about your journey. What led you to pivot from founder to investor? And almost at the same time, it sounds like, from tech and into the life sciences. Yeah, you know, it's hard to draw a linear roadmap from point A to point B to point C. Mm -hmm. I think probably this is due to the fact that to go way back in time, um, to describe a little bit just about myself, like forget the titles on things. Uh, I grew up as a child of immigrants and my immigrant parents also had immigrant parents. So we had two generations of immigrants. So when I was growing up, in fact, my parents pretty much it, it instilled in me this concept that where there's a will, there's a way, which I think another term for is, is the American dream, um, but also that I shouldn't take myself or life too seriously. In fact, they encouraged me in high school to not get perfect grades because they didn't want me to be too conceited or arrogant and also just recognize that there's sort of more to life out there. So by the time I went to college, in fact, I did not feel prepared to make a big decision about who I wanted to be or what profession I wanted in the long run by virtue of having this upbringing where my parents were blue collar immigrant workers in the United States. I'd never heard of these jobs like venture capital. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, you know, these, these kind of esoteric things that are now so commonplace and we take for granted are actually pretty niche professions that we are very privileged to even be um, contributing to or aware of. So when I was in college, after two years, I ended up taking some time off to figure out who I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. I worked in a variety of jobs ranging from working for the UN in The Hague. I worked for a, 
nonprofit. I worked for a science and policy think tank in Korea. I worked for a superior court judge. You know, I started an NGO actually on the side and was really one of my mentors who tapped me on the shoulder throughout this whole process of growth and evolution, who, you know, basically just sat me down and told me, look, this thing you're running on the side, this NGO, like that could be a full-time job. That's actually got a name. It's called entrepreneurship, you know, shocking. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that sort of tongue in cheek, but at the time it was, it really was shocking. And I credit that person a lot uh, with what happened next. To answer your question, I ended up joining Google, but all with the goal in mind of being a better founder at the end of the day. So my goal was never to be a career Googler. It was to learn about how the business of Google works. And so that kind of explains my progression from the very lowest ranks at Google to managing a media team, managing a multi-million dollar budget, and then eventually managing a sales team before I ended up embarking on this entrepreneurial endeavor. So at least there... Maybe there is a bit of a straighter line, which is I took a deviation to go learn at Google and then ended up going back to the founding route. And then after selling the last company, ended up in venture. Truly, I think because my heart is for people and I wanted to be supportive to founders in ways that I felt like I had been supported back in the day when I was building. So I know that's a lot, but hopefully that gives you a better sense for some of the philosophy that guided my life and career choices. No, absolutely. And it's, as you mentioned, we've discussed this briefly before on the personal side and being first generation myself, American college student, I really resonate with what you were saying about wanting to support phenomenal people doing exciting things and not really even being aware that these opportunities might have existed when we started. So it's only through the support and encouragement of mentors to us that we can even be here today to support others. And so thank you for sharing and providing that extra level of detail into your personal journey. It really sounds like uh, you've taken a, a path that let you explore. And I'm betting, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm betting that each of those different avenues still influences your way of thinking and the way you're able to provide um, support to your founders today. So I love hearing it. Totally, no, I think that's absolutely right. <laughs> And diving in uh, a little bit deeper, we've, we've talked now about your journey to um, venture. Would love to understand, with, now that we have that understanding, what does BioX data mean to you? You gave a brief overview earlier, but what, would love to hear your thoughts, especially as we think about historical differences of um, investment from tech to traditional biotech and the recent convergence uh, of the melding of tech and biology to develop tech bio platforms in recent years. As you said, Wing leads from the earliest stages of ideation all the way through Series A. And so as you think about investing in enterprise technology companies, as you think about investing in BioX data companies, what are your thoughts on this trend and, uh, and how, how does Wing fit in? Sure, happy to. Um, you know. To answer this question, I want to take us back about a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the average lifespan was what, 55 years of age. Mm -hmm. And back then it was actually infectious diseases that typically killed us versus now we have developed wonderful things like vaccines. And I'm sure we're all walking around with some form of that uh, in this day and age. And it's a good reminder, like we didn't have these technologies back a hundred years ago necessarily. And commonplace things like that we can now solve for were big killers back then. Mm -hmm. So now if we're looking at the set of problems that are plaguing us, of course, COVID and the present situation, um, you know, aside, on the whole, it's actually chronic diseases that are killing us now. And these chronic diseases are these pervasive things that we still have yet to uncrack and solve because biology is insanely complex. Like I wish I could actually just pull up a map of modern metabolism where you could see these mechanisms of action where one reaction here will catalyze something over there. And it's such an insanely complex endeavor to unpack 
metabolism, then no wonder we have yet to make a big dent in metabolic related diseases, really nasty things, things like cardiovascular disease or obesity, for instance. I truly believe that we, to this day, lack the tools to understand and unpack these biological insights in order to truly make a difference in solving these very chronic diseases. Um, and again, these, these, these diseases are nasty things, uh, neurological disease, right? Cancers, metabolic disease. These are actually the majority of the top 10 killers in the world today, even though we're living during COVID times. They're huge, huge killers. So what will it take to solve? What will it take to solve chronic diseases? Well, my thesis is A, we just need the tools to start with. So what will equip the biodeveloper to understand biology better? Well, things like metabolism can actually be understood through platforms like a company that I, in fact, back called Matterworks, which has now introduced ML into the mix in order to deconvolve what's happening in metabolism. And they will sell to biotechs and pharma companies to help create the foundation of data to understand biology better. That explains one pillar of my thesis, which are these novel data collection streams. Uh, you know, I'd count proteomics in that category. I, in fact, have had the pleasure of partnering with a company that does protein sequencing, a novel data set that I think will be extremely valuable in this new world that's being created that has a foundation of data. So under BioX data, Firmly, one category that I look at that I think will be extremely important are these companies creating novel data sets. Mm -hmm. But I actually don't think that the data alone, without the tools and the means to interpret the data, is enough. That's why the next category of companies that I invest in use machine learning, typically, or at least you know very sophisticated forms of computation and math applied to novel data in order to aid in discovery in the life sciences. So these companies might be, for example, using ML to engineer macrocyclic peptides to drug the undruggable, or they might be sifting through lots of RNA-seq data to mine for novel targets, which can then be um, really step change improvements in terms of drugs efficacy down the road. Uh, these ML app companies, as I call them, I think form the second foundation upon which the modern day life sciences will be built. And what's interesting here is in the past, it was kind of assumed in biotech that these companies would have to be, you know, very asset heavy companies and go through clinical trials and create drugs and eventually market them and launch them and have this whole process to becoming a very valuable company. But in fact, today, 80% of drug development is not done in big pharma. It's actually done within biotechs, eight, zero, 80%. There's a tremendous amount of phenomenal work that's being done within these quote unquote, smaller companies. And now the business model is evolving such that these companies can have more of a partnership driven approach, can sell their assets, can partner, can work in tandem with other companies who do have the machinery to take drugs to market. And I find that business model evolution extremely exciting as well. So, you know, to take a step back just in BioX data, we need to make a dent in these chronic diseases. And my personal thesis is it will take the hybrid of novel data plus the understanding of biology, which I think will come through computation. Hence why I focus at this intersection and why the companies I back are really technology companies at the end of the day who happen to be innovating in the life sciences. I think that makes a lot of sense. And there's certainly overlap with what we do at Alix around the tech bio space, where the stepwise change in the technology, especially something high throughput, multiplex, that combination of software, hardware, wetware, that allows you to develop the novel data set and then engineer on top of it in advance, again, in a very high throughput way, allows you to explore and develop new opportunities for therapeutics development or diagnostics or ideally combinations therein, creating that truly uh, ecosystem, truly an ecosystem company where you go from data 
to patient stratification and diagnostic to therapeutic. And that's something where I agree with you. I think by whether we call it bioexcited, whether we call it tech bio, whether we call it technology being applied in the life sciences or just this next evolution of biotech, it's a really exciting time we're living in and getting to be um, some of the privileged individuals helping drive it forward. Those are the entrepreneurs, but we get to support them and see what they're doing. And I think that's been, at least for me, really thrilling too. So. Really? Yeah, I agree. It's a big privilege. Yeah. And I don't take that lightly to have a role to play in aiding these founders in their audacious, crazy goals that will potentially be life-changing for and patients that they serve. Uh, it's, it's humbling. And let's build on that then. We have an understanding now of your investment goals, some of the theses you're working towards. Can you tell us a little bit more about your diligence process? How do you differentiate between, uh, to use a more tech-focused term, the signal and the noise when you're evaluate, evaluating companies, especially as we're talking about these novel areas where there's often no existing playbook? Sure. Yeah. You know, for me, it's a combination of a bunch of puzzle pieces that need to fit together. Um, you cannot have a company without having a really large market. If you have a large market, you just have a bit more wiggle room to play around with other than uh, versus if you have a company that's geared towards a small market, man, you better be precise and you better have, you kind of have to own that entire market in order to have a very valuable business. So part of my job is speaking to experts, doing my research, doing my diligence, even before meeting companies to understand where are the pockets of big market opportunities so that when I interface with an entrepreneur, I'm able to already kind of have that heuristic in the back of my mind um, and an understanding for how big is the potential of what this founder is trying to, trying to bring to the, to the market. Then in addition, because I invest so early stage, obviously the founder matters a lot but also the technology and the IP concerns around the technology and just, you know, getting that thing, dragging that thing out of wherever it was created, whether it's university or, you know, the hospital, like that actually matters quite a bit because you just don't want to run down this road and at the time of sale have lawyers point to your um, sort of messy past if the IP wasn't cleanly broken out and say, wait, this is going to hold up this billion dollar deal or whatever it is. So in terms of the actual technology, I do make sure to diligence the IP, bringing in some phenomenal people on the legal side of things to assist with that. And then with the technology, I always make sure to put the technology before experts. And I feel incredibly lucky that we have a phenomenal group of people who surround Wing some who have been founders in the past, some are professors, even, you know, a dean or two, folks from pharma who help me think through these technologies and ascertain, hey, do, will this actually work? Does this actually work? Can we actually legally operate this company and not run into some nasty roadblocks down the road? Uh, and then when it comes to founders, that's probably the most esoteric of all these categories that I really look for in an early stage company. Because founders are, you know, good founders are extraordinary people. And mm -hmm. by definition, if you're extraordinary, that means you're not normal. So your <laughs> typical way of diligencing a person, you know, might not necessarily apply to someone who's phenomenally spiky in one area and could use a little bit of help in other areas. So for there, I feel like, you know, a lot of investors talk about relying on their gut. You know, I do so to a certain degree, but at a certain point, I have to make sure to check my gut and say, Sarah, are you relying on heuristics that come from your limited understanding of what a good founder is? Or are you actually seeing this founder for what they can bring to the table? Which means I sometimes take bets on founders who would not be considered typical. A lot of my founders are quite young, which in biotech, you know, is a, you know, not, not that common of a concept. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes they'll be coming out of their PhD programs and this might even be their first job ever, right? And now they're leading this company that we've put millions of dollars into. But the thing I look for the most with founders, two things. One, do I feel like they have the slope this is a term one of my colleagues here at Wing loves to use. Do I feel like they have the slope 
where, yeah, they might be starting here, but if you hand them adversity, if you hand them challenges, if you hand them risks, they're able to easily adapt and get to this place where at the end of the journey, they almost emerge transformed professionally and personally as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I look for, do they have really good slope? And then there are little things that are, um, indications of, I wouldn't call it slope necessarily, but I would consider it more flexibility that I do look for because I found the best founders can roll with the punches where every time you meet them and every time you hear them give their pitch, it's a little bit different because they've adapted, they've learned from your questions, they've incorporated back into the pitch deck. And so the best founders I've found are extremely yeah, I think there's no other word for it. It's, it's just like flexible in terms of their thinking, because that gives me some insight into how they will respond if the market throws a random curveball at them, or if a competitor throws a curveball at them, or something internally comes up where 100% of startups have to deal with extremely complex challenges that you just could not foresee. So in terms of diligencing founders, I think that's a very important criterion for the CEO, especially, but also the founding team. And then, you know, to a lesser extent, I do look at who the company has managed to surround themselves with. If they have great advisors, wonderful, you know, can they hire? Can they actually sell people on their vision? That gives me a lens into how they might interface, not just with recruits, but also potentially with customers as well. But it's really kind of the amalgamation of all these things that I look for, given that I do focus so early stage. And I want to dive into that a little bit more deeply, but before we do, for any who might be in that entrepreneurial background and listening in, do you have any tips or tricks for founders, recommendations who are trying to reach out to uh, yourself at Wine Book? Yeah, happy to. Um, for starters, I just hold open office hours, so anyone can literally sign up for my office hours. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message and I can shoot you over the Calendly link. I might not always be helpful, right? I might not be the right investor for you. If you have a consumer business, I'm probably not the right investor for you. If you're also internationally focused, I'm probably not the right investor, but I do make an effort just to make sure that at least founders can interface with somebody who has access to this privileged information when it comes to fundraising, because otherwise I sort of fear that it will remain that privileged and within these hidden walled gardens. So that would be point A. Uh, point B, we have a lot of really exciting stuff going on, going on at Wing. And our goal here is not just to help our founders, but we want to open source this information. You know, it's kind of one of the reasons why I love bio so much, quite frankly, because I think we share this philosophy. My goal is not just to help my founders. My goal is to help the entire ecosystem succeed because my God, isn't that great for humanity? But also it's great for innovation. And if the entire ecosystem succeeds, if there are more success examples, there'll be more investors, there'll be more capital. Hopefully mm -hmm. that'll breed more innovation. And I think that's what our industry needs. We need to have a diversity of funding sources and of ideas from a diverse set of entrepreneurs in order for us to truly make a dent, like I mentioned, in those chronic diseases. So absolutely office hours. And then be on the lookout for some of our programming and our content, which is open source and anyone can really learn from. Um, and I think those are probably the two best places for now uh, to get in touch with me and to sort of get in, embedded in the wing family and the wing ecosystem. I love the transparency and thank you for the kind words on BIOS. We're only successful because people such as yourself offer your thoughts and your opinion so freely and you share that as you say we have access to privileged information and so being able to put it out there for others is something that i think we all take seriously mm -hmm. so diving in a little bit deeper uh, we've been talking now off and on about how you like to get involved in companies from the very earliest stage and we know there are some you're working with that are still in stealth mode so how at wing do you think about uh, assisting in the process of venture creation talked about the back end office, but what's, what's the meat and bones? Yeah, I think it starts with the heart, uh, where it's a deep partnership from the get-go. And the interesting thing about a partnership is with a partnership, there's actually 
not really hierarchy, right? Like mm-hmm. my goal is not to come in and rule with an iron fist and say, this is a command and control situation. And I know investors who prefer that method and that's just not me. So when I come in, we- As a founder, I would have been shocked if it was. Sorry for yeah, the Yeah, exactly. Totally. Um, and you know, it's actually because also I wouldn't be good at it because if I were to be the founder, I'd be the founder, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. And I recognize that I will only know this much about a business because the founder will be in it 24 seven this much. So at a certain point, I also have to respect the founder will know more about their specific product and their specific pain they're solving. But what I can bring to the table is by virtue of where I'm sitting, where my 24 seven is looking at macro trends that are happening. Like I mentioned, my diligence work for, so, so I have a prepared mind about markets and products that make sense. That can be enormously helpful to a startup. Mm-hmm. Also, my networks, right? Um, you know, I don't want to um, sort of overly sell this, but it's true. I meet with a lot of people by virtue of where I am and by virtue of what I've done. And so if I can use those resources to positively impact my companies, of course, I'm going to do that. Um, so I think it really starts with the partnership at the core based on mutual respect. And then the second thing is in terms of a decision-making process, again, I don't want to be command and control, but sometimes I will disagree. And by the way, founders, you want that. You want investors with a different perspective. Otherwise, why are you bringing them onto the gap table if they're not bringing something of value that's differentiated? So we will disagree, but when that happens, I think it's very important to have an understanding that you might seed and say, hey, I disagree with what you're doing, but I trust and respect you enough to go run that hypothesis. But if it's not working, it needs to come back around. There needs to be a very fast pivot. That's why I look for flexibility um, in order to put the company in the right direction. And so it's a series of micro moves where hell, you know, sometimes no one knows what the right answer is. These are new companies that are innovating. But if we have that understanding, then I think you can launch and iterate and get to a place where directionally you're going in, in the right, um, making the right moves and hopefully not spending too much capital along the way. More practically speaking, when I join a company, then we typically only work on the f- most important or second most important problem at a time. Mm. There are a million things you could go fix, but what's the one or two thing, what are the one or two things that really make a difference now? And let's work on those and hell, again, maybe I don't have the right answer, but I will help you get to the right answer either through experts, either through brainstorming or launching and trying a bunch of different experiments. We will get to a good place eventually. And so the way that I work with my founders really varies in terms of how it looks from founder to founder, depending on what those one or two things might be. But hopefully that gives you a sense for more generally speaking sort of what's the philosophy behind my work when I'm working with founders, which is rolling up my sleeves and getting right there in the trenches with them. Um, and we use this term internally, but it's true. It's kind of rolling rocks uphill, right? Um, mm-hmm. But doing it together. Yeah, and I love the way you think about being a good partner, starting from that word partner and viewing it as such. So uh, it's something that I'm sure your portfolio companies appreciate. And Taking that to, uh, again, focus on an internal term at Wing, you've spoken before about uh, founders' early walk in the woods and how that links back to flexibility. Uh, Can you just describe a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, I think especially in industries that are a bit opaque, which Mm -hmm. the life sciences can be, which also healthcare on the whole can be, because these business models are changing and also the buying behaviors, they're just not really that well known as opposed to other parts of enterprise tech. There is a process where you go on this kind of exploratory walk as a person, as a founder. And we do internally call it the walk in the woods where you're encountering things, you're learning things, and you know it can kind of feel like meandering. And I say that because you know it might feel that way, but That's where I think the role of an informed partner can really make a huge difference because as you're going through, as you're bumping along trees, as you're figuring out, okay, what is the process to make a drug? 
what are those timelines? You know, you bump along some trees. When should I hire my first salesperson? Should I fire this head of uh, engineering because they want blah, 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 equity, you know, bump along some more trees. You're figuring it out. But if you have someone next to you, who's a partner, who's seen many stories like yours play out before, they can potentially point you in the right direction so that you avoid bumping into certain trees uh, and maybe only the necessary ones in order for you to get and involve to the business model in the company that makes the most sense for your business. Mm -hmm. So it's not unexpected. And in fact, I say that outright to normalize it. It's okay, you know, at the early stages to feel like, yeah, maybe sometimes I don't really know what I'm doing, or I'm spending a lot of my time figuring out these things that feel like they should be solved problems before. But guess what? You're operating in a space that's been traditionally very opaque, and there just are fewer resources for bio founders out there. Or even if you, you know, this happened with one of my companies, if you run a Google search for what insurance company should I pick as an early stage bio company, nothing comes up. And if you did the same thing for the enterprise tech world, selling it to technology companies, pure technology companies, there's a whole plethora of resources. So anyway, it's totally, totally normal. That's why I really believe a community of support can help shorten mm -hmm. your walk in the woods. Um, but if you do bump into a few trees here and there, like you are not alone. That is just the process of being a founder in bio these days. Don't hesitate to reach out if I can play a role in helping you on your journey. And there are many, many people, the fine folks at BIOS as well, who I'm sure would be more than happy to lend uh, lend an ear to your problems and give you some meaningful advice to the communities that we're building in BioX data. Absolutely. And it's if we can help you avoid some breaks, avoid some bruises, and maybe just get a scrape or two, uh, I would say I think it's something we're all, a mission we're all passionate about and something you'll see more and more from uh, on the BIOS side in the coming weeks. So thank you, Sarah, um, for always speaking so kindly of us. You've made some phenomenal investments, Sarah, in companies like Asimov, you mentioned Matterworks, Unnatural Products, uh, Glyphic. And as we think about this increasing integration of tech and the life sciences to form that BioX data, we're seeing ever increasing requirements for interdisciplinary teams. And one, a lot of your comments um, about supporting companies has been on that team angle. So at Wing, how do you think about supporting inter dis interdisciplinary team and culture building? when it's so critical, especially nowadays, to making sure that a company is well uh, well set up for success. Yeah, you know, every single one of those companies you mentioned is highly interdisciplinary. And I think that that is by design, right? The biggest innovations actually come from the intersections, mm -hmm. which is why we have this X and BioX data it's to represent the intersections. Uh, where true innovation can come out. And so in terms of how we support these founders, I think first and foremost, our expertise and why we've been able to have 22 companies that have IPO'd or sold for over a billion is firmly on the business of building a business. And to that end, I'd say that actually, um, that is a skill in and of itself. And that is something that we've developed as a team for the past few decades, in fact, as investors. And so bringing that to these intersectionality teams, I think is an asset and why founders like to work with us because otherwise, you know, it's not super clear where you would go to find really hands-on good advice if you don't partner with a firm like ours, who's in the business of creating good businesses, uh, especially with the enterprise tech sales motion, which our companies that we invest in have. Mm -hmm. More specific within that, because my team is comprised of technologists where, you know, our head of marketing, for example, she was the number two marketer at Twilio at an Envision app. These are tech companies. Or Rajiv, our head of research, he puts together events um, with Fortune 1000 sibling goes, also spanning the technology world, as well as folks from pharma. You know, we, in and of ourselves, walk the walk and have a highly interdisciplinary team. And so we're drawing from all those different experiences to come in and to aid our companies with the right advice. Something I wanna be really crystal clear on though, in the spirit of full transparency here is, it's not like we're coming in and telling you what algorithms to run. It's not like we're coming in and having a point of view on your database design. 
right? Like I mentioned before, like we trust that our technologists that we're backing are 10 times more informed about this um, technology stack and what they're innovating on. I mean, the folks that we work with typically have PhDs, some might even be MD PhDs. And so it's not that we're coming in and making decisions like that. It's that we're coming in and offering strategic hands-on help. And if you need to hire a technologist to complement your team, that is something that would help with. And we do very frequently with our talent program and our head of talent. And we do that at scale too. Um, or it could be if you need the right advisory resource, or if you want to add an independent board member, like those are the things that we think are strategic uh, to sort of building the business. And that's more where we get involved as opposed to offering interdisciplinary help in the form of like actually going in and helping you write code that, that I would not be able to do, nor would I want to do, nor would you probably want me to do either. <laughs> not something I'd look forward to either. <laughs> and I think, um, as you said from the beginning, we're not here to be prescriptive. We're just here to offer thoughts and support as much as we can. And one of the areas where uh, as there's particular importance, and I think rightly focused today, is around diversity, equity, and inclusion of founders, of boards, and of teams. Now, we can't make those decisions, but by the same time, I do think, talking about the privileged position VCs can be in, we can try and provide support. We can try to uh, maybe occasionally offer that feedback and say, how do we think about DE and I in early, from the earliest stages? How do we incorporate that into team building? I would just love your thoughts in the space, having built a few companies yourself and supporting the creation of so many others. Yeah, totally. You know, I think the first thing is encouraging my companies to track the right metrics, because if you don't track it, how do you know if you're improving or how do you know if you're declining? And so there is a section in the board um, in, in the course of the board uh, readout where we do go over just how things are looking, which becomes a very important thing as a company grows and develops outside of just the founding team, because there you can really be intentional about who you're bringing on. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is because we do offer help with talent as the board member, I can make sure that I am sourcing candidates who represent a diversity of perspectives. And that could be a variety of things, right? It could be gender, it could be ethnicity and race. It could also just be, you know, walk a different form of a walk um, socioeconomically as well. Yep. So I try to do my best in terms of sourcing candidates who do represent diversity. And of course, ultimately the call is still on the founders. And so that's not something where I wanna um, control and command, but I think I can do my part as a board member to make people aware, to make people um, feel like this is something that they need to improve. And then to even go so far as to source candidates who will improve diversity within companies, because that's not just good for humanity, that's good for business. And I truly believe that having diversity on teams is just good for business. And it's actually been proven time and time again. So I do that as a fiduciary of my company. It's not just because it's something that I personally happen to care about a lot as well. And I think, as you say, just oftentimes providing that reminder. Founders are dealing with so much. They have so much on their minds. It can be easy to not juggle everything. And so having that support structure that says, hey, we're going to find a few more diverse candidates. And this is something where you have an opportunity to improve what you're working on. I think uh, oftentimes that can be enough. So it's, it's great to um, hear a little bit more about that process. And from the beginning, uh, bless you. <laughs> uh, from the beginning of your time with Wayne, and actually from the beginning of your career, I feel as though you've had a very future forward tech enabled perspective. I, I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts. Um, what are you most excited by that's coming next in this cycle of emerging technologies? Yeah, you know, I think that now the various data streams, the omics, are starting to be worked on, but haven't really quite reached the maturity that they're quote unquote mainstream. Like you see a lot of startups, you see a lot of companies saying they have a multi-omic approach. What does that actually mean? So one thing that I'm personally very, very excited for is A, these data streams becoming mainstream and de facto 
just like mm -hmm. in areas of enterprise tech where you rely on certain data streams to build your technical infrastructure and your tech stack, I think that the pieces for the life sciences in the tech stack that's used in drug development specifically, that's being formed. And I would love to see that become in the mainstream because after that, then we're going to see the truly novel innovations that come from not just focusing on genomics, for example, which has been phenomenally, um, you know, powerful in terms of certain insights, but man, imagine the world when it's not just genomics, but you're also looking at proteomics, the mm. epigenome, right? You're looking at spatial transcriptomics, all these different things coming together because we're understanding biology better. Therefore, at the end of the day, we're able to use computation to ultimately help patients at the end of the day. And I believe unlock the next 30, 40 years, potentially in our lifespans, once we've really got those chronic diseases under control. So I don't know, some might say that I'm crazy by virtue of where I sit. I'm actually extremely optimistic about all these innovations that I actually think are just around the corner. So that's why I've spent all my time at this intersection and I've kind of bet my profession and my career on this um, and support these founders and this new world that's being shaped where I really think humanity on the whole will potentially be dramatically positively impacted. Well, and that's a note of optimism that I, I almost hate to uh, turn around with my next question, but <laughs> what we'd simultaneously love to ask. Um, is there anything you're bearish on? Not because you know we don't, it isn't necessarily a potential, but maybe the technology needs further development before it's really ready for this prime time that we're discussing. You know, I have a perspective on this that I think might not be a popular one, which is given enough time and resources with really capable founders, I actually, I'm not bearish on too many things. I think if you look at some of these liquid biopsy companies, for example, mm -hmm. you know, these were not obvious and had people given up when the first setbacks emerged, like these companies would not have actually gone on to exist in the ways that they are now. Um, even in the early days of like a Solexa uh, before Illumina, I think that there will be technical setbacks and with certain things with biology, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's true. But I actually prefer, and maybe this is just by virtue of my personality, I prefer not to think of it in terms of what I'm bearish on, because on the whole, I think on the balance of things, we need to be a little bit more optimistic and give these companies room and space to breathe and try things and make mistakes and mm -hmm. even fail from time to time. And so you know, I would be hesitant to sort of um, denounce a particular technology or method of approach. Although, of course, in my mind, you know, I have some of those things. And so I might not be as eager to invest behind certain trends and technologies. Um, but right now, yeah, I kind of just don't want to put that out into the world <laughs> because I think that with the right founding team and the right backers and the right amount of time kind of afforded to these technologies that we've been surprised before. And I think we'll continue to be surprised in the future too. Oh, and surprise is something we're always looking for. It's something mm -hmm. I think that is, people have called the spice of life. And I think it's definitely something that we love to see in the innovation space, especially. So we've, we've talked about that and how in the innovation space, uh, we're not just seeing R&D innovation, but we're seeing a phenomenal amount of business innovation today when it comes to these BioX companies. Can you share your thoughts, um, having seen so much of this, having helped your founders walk through so many of these questions and journeys, just how do we think about go-to-market strategy and the company journey for this next wave of BioX companies that are coming forward today? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. Um, and even though I've now backed over a dozen companies innovating in the space, I will be the first person to say that I think that the sausage is still being made. And I think these business models are still evolving because uh, these, you know, methods of partnership, they just were really frowned upon and even economically didn't make sense, I think, in the past. But now we have some companies who are leading the charge and showing that you can have a partnerships or sort of SaaS-based model where you're working with a lot of different players and still add up to a super valuable company. 
but it's still definitely being developed. And so in terms of working with my companies, I think first and foremost, you need to get the perspective of the customer. And mm -hmm. so voice of the customer uh, diligence, I think becomes important. And that's where bringing in the right experts who can offer that lens from the customer point of view is really important. And then it's ensuring that the company is well capitalized to actually hit the milestones that a customer would want to see. And that's different for every company, right? Mm -hmm. If you're operating in a certain space, it might be enough to get to target validation. But increasingly, it actually seems like you need to get a little bit more than that. And so when you're thinking about fundraising, it's what are those milestones for my specific business in the context of my customers and my technology that makes sense? And that's just, you know, all across the map. So anyway, that's another important consideration in thinking about business models. Um, and I think the third one is probably just to learn as much as possible and be a sponge and understand that there's no one true way to go about things because things are so much in flux. So if you can be flexible and nimble and carve out a space for yourself, then even as a seed company, sometimes you can get to customer validation and, um, and even revenue, but you really sort of have to be in tune with what's going on in the market and willing to adjust your plans accordingly which of course is even more important during these times, considering the crisis that we're in financially and what's mm -hmm. happening in the public markets and biotech today. And that sounds like a natural extension. Given the tumultuous times, do you have any thoughts or feedback for founders? And is there a way we can think about supporting them as VCs? Yeah. So as VCs, I think it's to not be afraid, especially at the early stages, to still take bets on companies. Um, otherwise, we're going to fall into this loop, and I've seen it happen before, where investors are afraid to bet on companies without traction. But how mm -hmm. do you get traction without capital? And so you end up in this limbo world where the best innovations were not commercialized for a long period of time, unless you had somebody who was a repeat founder who already had a lot of success but who has access to people like that, right? So anyway, for us, I think it's continuing to invest. So I'm still very active as an investor and I encourage other early stage investors to invest. Then when companies are hitting milestones, you know, to encourage them to go for the early revenue, real money making opportunities, as opposed to before where you might be able to exist for a long time and even IPO without having those revenue milestones in mind. So, you know, really going for those business opportunities. And then at the end of the day, being open and honest and transparent, even with companies you don't end up backing, giving real mm -hmm. feedback as to why you're saying no, which is hard, of course, to carve out time to be vulnerable in that way to a founder who could easily just turn back around and say, I hate you. Why did you say no to us? Um, but it's to try to carve out time and space for that sort of honest feedback at the end of the day. But look, it's hard. And mm -hmm. I'd be the first to say, like, I deeply empathize because this is just a really tough time to fundraise. So startups, if you're listening, get lean. Cut anything that's unnecessary. Try to extend your runway as much as possible. I'd say two, two and a half years minimum if you can. And then in terms of your fundraising strategy, if you don't have that much runway, try not to be too precious right now. The most important goal in mind right now for me, when I'm encouraging my startups and whatever journeys they're on is survive. Survive, get to profitability if you can, try to bring in revenue, weather the storm, uh, and don't be, um, yeah, don't be, I guess, overly precious when it comes to fundraising and terms and all that right now. And we'll be there to support you along the way. So keeping that forward looking perspective, uh, what's coming next for Wing? Yeah. So one of the things I'm super excited about this summer, in fact, we're launching our new Founder Docs product, which is a fancy way of saying we're open sourcing some of this institutional knowledge, not just from us, but also from contributors who are friends of Wing to try to demystify the process of creating an extraordinarily successful company. So that's on the horizon. And then 
more in-person events for the first time in what seems like forever uh, by way of our uh, bio breaks, as I call them, that we're doing um, both here and then we plan to do some in Boston. So if you're interested in any of those things, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll make sure to put you on our email distribution and let you know when some of those things come to fruition. Absolutely. I would love to join you for some of the Boston events. And yeah. As you say, it's exciting getting to actually meet people in person again. Totally. But yeah. Before, before we come to a close, then a few rapid fire questions just to cap things off on this phenomenal okay. discussion. What, coming from a background as a founder, what advice would you give to those in our audience who are seeking to get into VC themselves? Oh, to get into VC. Um, you know, I think the number one mistake that people make is they only network with VCs when in fact, one of the biggest things that VCs are looking for in terms of hiring a new investor is proprietary deal flow. And what that means is your access to early stage or, you know, whatever stage founder. So if I were you, I would spend less time networking just with the VCs, more time developing your reputation, your expertise, your trust in communities with entrepreneurs, so that when you are having that interview conversation, you actually have something to bring to the table, some network or some knowledge that that VC actually might not have and would appreciate. And as we think about uh, connecting with those founders and taking it in that direction, do you have any calls for startups? Yeah, you know, I uh, tend to not sort of be prescriptive about these things because I don't think I have the most imaginative minds. So I'll just leave it at novel data streams. So if you're building something that's a picks and shovels platform in the life sciences, I want to know about it. And then also if you're an ML application that is targeting something with a large market opportunity at the end of the day, where your platform's able to spin off multiple innovations and is truly a platform, I want to know about that too. So I'll just leave it kind of high level there, but please don't hesitate to reach out. Oh, that high level is great. And on the aspect of reaching out, uh, any other closing thoughts, something we, we skipped over, shameless plugs, uh, anything you'd like to like to wrap uh, wrap up on? No, I think that's about it. Um, you know, stay tuned for the Founder Docs products and let's build this BioX data community together. If you made it to the end of this podcast, I think you are uh, truly somebody who is inclined to be a great participant um, in this community that we're building. So it doesn't take just one or two people, right? It takes a village. And I look forward to welcoming you to the Wink community and then in whole, hopefully we can build this BioX data community together. Um, thank you, Sarah, for an absolutely fantastic episode. I know we're all excited about the founder docs, as well as everything you're building at Wing, and we, we're, be, we're excited to build this ecosystem together. And today, we're very grateful for your time. Thank you again. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.